Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for July 26th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopp Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is a capability-based authorization infrastructure for distributed high throughput computing. Our presenter is Brian Bockelman. Brian is a principal investigator at Mortgage Institute for Research and a co-PI on the Partnership to Advance Throughput Computing, also known as PATH, an institute for research and innovation in software for high energy physics. Within the OSG, the Open Science Grid, he leads the technology area, which provides the software and technologies that underpin OSG's fabric of services. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, click on chat, and type your question there. But we also are planning on taking questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Brian. Brian, welcome. Hey, thanks and welcome everybody uh, out there on the participant list. I see a lot of familiar names and, and a lot of names I don't know. Um, and, and actually, since the little introduction blurb was written, uh, one thing that's uh, occurred that's really important for this line of work is that NSF funded a new project called uh, SIOF, uh, which I'll, I'll touch just a little bit, but it is a, an investment in kind of the, the vision and this approach of uh, toward authorization for uh, for distributed computing. So, uh, you know, I, I am just like with Path, only but a lowly co-PI, and uh, Jim Basney is the PI, and I see he's he's joined us. So, give me a second to share screen. Hit the go button. All right, so this is, uh, you know, as I said, titled here, Capability-Based Authorization Infrastructure for Distributed High Throughput Computing. Uh, so with that, I, I got a bingo for getting all my, my buzzwords in in one title. Uh, but if I would come back and decide on an alternate title that's more about what this presentation is, is going to cover, it's uh, who are you and what can you do? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit today about the different concepts involved and how at least I mentally pull them apart uh, as I think about building authorization systems. Uh, we'll have a, a trip down uh, memory lane, at least for, for some of us, to talk about uh, how the different uh, systems have come together, particularly on the distributed infrastructure. So uh, I, I see, again, uh, a couple of folks like... Uh, Dave Kelsey, who uh, serves the institutional memory and, and feel free to disagree with me as needed. And then I'll talk about where we're taking the system toward and, and why we think it's uh, both uh, uh, new and uh, significantly improved. Uh, but first, a couple of basics. Uh, so if I'm gonna try to lay down some uh, definitions here, I think of high throughput computing as maximizing the throughput of computing resource toward a common problem. And of course, uh, for us here at Mortgage and for, I suspect, everybody here on the phone call, uh, we're you know, trying to use computing in different ways uh, for the advancement of science. So we, we have uh, individual scientists all the way up to uh, very large collaborations that are trying to leverage uh, different computing resources to do simulations, to analyze data, uh, to uh, synthesize data, to filter, what, whatever it might be, but we're you know, all looking at this through the lens of open science. And uh, particularly, I'll talk a lot uh, about how we do things uh, on uh, the OSG consortium. So uh, if I have to have a, a sentence for OSG, I'd say it's dedicated to the advancement of all of open science, to the practice of distributed high throughput computing and advancement of its state of the art. So if I try to unpack that a bit, uh, again, the salient points are open science. Uh, so no, no nuclear bomb simulations here, uh, no HIPAA data. This is all data we want protected. Uh, it's private, it's uh, 
very valuable to the researchers uh, involved, uh, but likely nobody's going to jail if it leaks, which gives a maybe the, the, the frame of mind. Um, I added a keyword distributed in front of high throughput computing. Uh, so of course, when we talk about high throughput computing, we're often thinking about you know things that are distributed amongst multiple computers. But I like to throw the, that uh, extra letter D in there to emphasize that uh, we are really heavily distributed across sites. So here's this uh, lovely map where I've added uh, the, the blue and the green stars are different places where we have uh, compute uh, infrastructure across the US that are uh, contributing to the OSG. And uh, you'll notice that the role of, of OSG and, and of course the other entities we uh, I'll talk about are kind of dual pur purpose. Not only are we trying to advance science, but we're also trying to advance the science of uh, distributed high throughput computing. So uh, in terms of you never want to be caught standing still, uh, this allows us to uh, improve the services, improve the offerings, and you know, in turn, improve the science that people can do with, with the tool set. Uh, so similarly, here uh, at Wisconsin, uh, Mortgage is on the UW-Madison campus. Uh, we have the Center for High Throughput Computing, or CHTC. And this has been working uh, uh, to, since 2006 uh, to similarly uh, bring the power of HTC to all fields of research and allow the future of HTC to be shaped by insight. And CHTC and, and OSG have been kind of working somewhat in parallel and, and hand in hand for many years. Uh, CHTC, for example, produces the HT Condor software suite. And the OSG Consortium is one of the big users and drivers uh, for, for HT Condor. Uh, so one thing that's changed is uh, starting last year, instead of being uh, somewhat parallel or, or interrelated, we're really tight at the hip now. Uh, so the two entities, CHTC and OSG, are part of a new NSF-funded partnership uh, to, to kind of drive that, that vision forward. So, uh, if you haven't uh, heard of it or seen it, uh, feel free to, to check out our website. Uh, but this, you know, these two sides of uh, you know, advancing high throughput computing, you'll see tied together really closely going into the future. So again, OSG provides a fabric of services. Uh, so we run things that maybe are exposed to the internet. And uh, we turn raw compute capacity into effective throughput. So an important thing to notice is OSG doesn't actually own any hardware. Uh, uh, there, there's not a single person that I can tell what to do with their hardware. Uh, but uh, we have services that they can add their compute capacity toward. Uh, all the different providers have uh, are autonomous, so they can decide on the policy of how their resources are used. Um, we provide access points where people can log in and get access to the compute and, or data. And the sorts of uh, capacity that people contribute are, uh, you know, span from hardware dedicated to a given project. So we have a numerous, for example, uh, physics projects that bring their own clusters and hardware to the OSG with very specific policies about who can use them. Uh, there's opportunistic uh, university clusters. Uh, so this, these are the sort of clusters where people might say, well, I only run at 80% usage. Uh, I can give you the other 20% if you allow me to preempt you when my local scientists need it. So these are what we refer to as opportunistic usage. Uh, people do bring, although it's somewhat rare, cloud compute credits. So you know, fire up your VMs and your, your favorite cloud providers. And then one that we're increasingly work with are extract allocations on major NSSCI resources. So the uh, one of the big visions of OSG is you can take all these different compute capacities, uh, put your workloads at an access point, and have that one place where you can put all your workloads to uh, get uh, effectively use uh, and turn into throughput any of these different kinds of resources you might have access to. Uh, just to give people the uh, the size and shape of the resource, uh, resource that they're using OSG, we tend to be about uh, 2 billion uh, CPU hours, 
uh, over a 12 month period. And uh, depending on whether you're really measuring sites or endpoints, you can either look at it as about 100 sites or about a, 140 endpoints. Uh, the important aspect here is that this is a national scale resource uh, for the NSF community. And in fact, there are uh, even international contributors and uh, partners within the OSG, although uh, with uh, apologies, it's harder to fit them all on the map. So we tend to show the, the US centric view. So uh, 2 billion CPU hours, and even though we like to tell ourselves cores are cheap and plentiful, uh, in the end, 2 billion CPU hours is, is uh, a pretty valuable resource. Uh, you know, if you would convert it using funny money to uh, cloud time on EC2, for example, at least at sticker prices, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars at cloud time. Uh, so the, the question I want to ask for today is, how do we protect and manage access to this resource? How do we control authorization and decide uh, what is allowed to utilize the compute or, or storage within the OSG? So uh, if you could forgive me to, for, for going into computer science lecture mode, I, I do want to at least think a little bit through the definitions of what I mean when I talk about authorization. Uh, so, so I'm going to start with a definition for, for that and saying, you know, authorization is determining access rights or privileges to, to a given resource. Uh, it tends to be a computing term. Uh, or at least uh, the people who are going to be joining on this webinar. I'm sure all of us think about this in terms of computing term, uh, but authorization, of course, is familiar uh, in, in everyday life. Uh, so my ID card uh, got me access to the elevators in the morning when I came up to my office. Uh, my, my passport authorizes me into a particular country or uh, maybe, maybe at least these days, uh, vaccine passports. Uh, if I have a baseball ticket, it gets me in the baseball game. And if you have a, a Zoom URL, uh, it, it got you hopefully into this meeting. And the, my, my mental construct of this is, you know, authorization is some sort of function. Uh, it has a number of inputs that it takes into consideration. It makes a decision. And then we have a policy of, you know, in different things that I'm allowed to do. And as I build up a authentication and authorization infrastructure, what I really am doing is I'm defining this function and I'm thinking about what inputs go into the function in order to make my decision about what, what privileges I'm giving to someone. Now, we, we typically uh, split the authorization into really two, two phases. Uh, in terms of making that decision about privileges. Uh, we tend to have an authentication phase uh, where we establish an identity uh, for a remote entity. And then we take that identity and map it to a list of access rights. And, and typically, uh, so, so here we have our authentication function that produces an identity and then authorization function that takes that identity and produces our access rights. And as inputs to this process, we have what we think of as uh, credentials. Uh, so, so some sort of knowledge that, that establishes, in this case, a fact, a, an identity. And uh, for most of us, when we log into our Gmail or, or uh, log into a website, we tend to think of the, a very familiar credential scheme of username and password. So uh, we have our remote entity that comes up and wants to do some sort of action. It provides a username and password as its credentials to authenticate. Uh, maybe this is my, my Gmail address, you know, bockelman at gmail.com. And that bockelman uh, Google account is then mapped to a list of authorized access rights, such as reading that email. This is uh, a fairly common scheme in terms of computing, uh, but of course it's not the only scheme uh, in terms of authorization. So again, Gmail, maybe we need password and uh, two-factor accounts or two-factor access. Uh, 
it would be that it results in a authenticated identity and we can get access to my inbox. We can go into some of these other examples I gave. Uh, we have an office building uh, that has an ID card, which is you know, not a password, of course, that got me into my elevators. Uh, and I like these last two ones uh, because uh, they don't necessarily have an authentication component. So particularly, uh, if you go to a baseball game, you have a ticket, it hopefully looks like something like this. It authorizes you to sit in section four, seat 34B, uh, but nowhere does this ticket and nowhere at the, uh, the, the guy or, or gal at the door uh, gets your authenticated username or identity. So there are, are in fact plenty of authorization schemes that are independent of authentication as far as uh, being able to uh, uh, make a decision. Now, uh, within computing, there's also the concept of traceability. Uh, so I might be able to go back and figure out whose credit card purchased this ticket, and I could tie that credit card maybe to an individual, uh, but this particular credential itself doesn't necessarily identify me. So here I might be able to have my authorization and still trace as needed back to the individual who got the ticket. So we come to the crux of, of the, the question, which is what is the right scheme for distributed computing? So uh, attempt number one, uh, identity mapping. So if you rewind uh, about 20 years ago, uh, one of the really primary drivers for distributed computing was large uh, physics experiments like the LHC. You know, that there was uh, particularly this one feared that the computing cost was high enough there wouldn't be enough power on site uh, or nearby Geneva. And I would say probably very little enthusiasm for funding agencies to go buy CERN, a bunch of computers all for itself. And in particular, the LHC is a large collaboration uh, composed of hundreds of labs and universities around the world, each of which ran their own computing infrastructure. So the question is why uh, not uh, link together the computing resources of each of these laboratories or sites and use that as the solution for the computing needs uh, for this particular science experiment. So and as they say, and off we go. So if you think of this a uh, concept of taking different labs with existing infrastructures and starting to uh, put things together, uh, one thing that of course is really familiar for each of these is the idea of a user account, uh, a login that's local to the site for each user. Uh, so we had uh, 10,000 physicists and 60 sites uh, to establish a, for each person, a local identity at each site uh, using our typical username and passwords. We'd need 600,000 username and passwords. And uh, to say, we can, we can do that math. That's, that's not an attractive way of going. So instead, uh, the LHC and uh, the computer science community utilize the, the idea of identity mapping. So each user would establish a global identity. A mechanism would be developed to map the global identity to a local identity. And then that local identity, there were some decisions made about what that user is authorized to do. So we have authentication where we take the global to local and then our local produce our, our uh, privileges and policy. And this of course led to a natural question is, that's wonderful, but how do I get that global identity? And from that, uh, uh, we uh, was born, had born the grid security infrastructure, uh, which was an attempt to establish uh, global identities for the entire community. So uh, this involved policies and standards establishing uh, for verifying identities, uh, establishing a identity authority to make to actually execute these policies and standards. And uh, audits, for example, were put in place to show that these authorities were all following that. And between the audits and uh, building up these policy process, we, or the community established mutual trust. And the set of authorities are, were called the, and are called the International Grid Trust Federation. 
with the idea that an identity is stabbed, issued by any one of these authorities uh, that work in maybe different locales or communities uh, can, through the policies that were agreed upon, be trusted by all. And then, of course, once the identity was verified, we then could issue some sort of credential. And uh, what do we use? Uh, this X509 certificate. So X509 is just a wonderful little strange corner of the internet. Uh, and, and I love it because it was born out of the International Telecommunication, Telecommunication Union's uh, attempt to, uh, to create a distributed global directory information uh, scheme back in the, the 1980s. So the idea was uh, through the, the predecessor X500 that there could be a global phone book uh, uh, to, to some extent. So that unfortunately never came to fruition, uh, but what it did establish was a standard and a schema for uh, taking identities and associating them with cryptographic keys. So I, I might have my funny looking identity here. You can see kind of this attempt of a hierarchy uh, within the, this is my uh, subject of my identity. And it's, I establish a public key with my identity. So this was uh, somewhat of a strange little uh, project in the corner from the telecom folks. Uh, however, it happened to actually really fit the needs for a company called Netscape when they started wanting to secure e-commerce transactions. And thus, uh, to some extent, uh, became a component of HTTPS and that's now used every, everywhere today. And when I, I'll say this with only a minor amount of exaggeration as I'd say that uh, a critical piece of today's global economy uh, relies on a failed attempt to build a phone book. So uh, beyond this cute little story, it turns out this uh, idea of establishing identity, associating cryptographic keys, and uh, knowing a way to distribute uh, the identity authorities was also exactly what we, we needed uh, within this community. So uh, a certificate becomes issued by a certificate authority. So that IGTF organization, uh, that I told you about ultimately has many different authorities. And then uh, the CA signs the certificate with its own key pair. Uh, we assume that the cryptography is sufficiently difficult. We think it's effectively impossible for anyone but the CA to create the signature. Uh, but importantly, anybody can verify the certificate without contacting the CA. And then we assume that any action signed by that certificate's key pair is assumed to be approved by the identity itself. Uh, again, relying on the same set of cryptography. So within this model, uh, the X509 credential is your identity. Uh, so anybody with your identity credential has your power of attorney. Uh, so if your bank accepted GSI authentication, if they have your credential, they could talk to your bank. Uh, and of course, that's a very powerful uh, mechanism. And we had invented over the years several different ones to take that and start to whittle away uh, uh, and remove different parts of the power. So the, the CA could publish a list of revoked uh, credentials, things that were stolen or no longer under control of the individual. Each certificate has an expiration date, uh, so things it can't be used for forever and ever. Uh, when users need to give their authority to somebody else to act on their behalf, they can create a sub-certificate, a delegation. Uh, and, and this uh, allows you to delegate or impersonate somebody, <clears throat> maybe only for a few hours. And, and in fact, there's even the concept of a limited delegation that's less powerful than the, the full one. But unfortunately, uh, to, to a large extent, the community never got around to decide what limited means. Uh, so this really made the concept of limited delegation minimally useful. So if you have the, the back of your mind, that this picture of the distributed infrastructure and this identity mapping model, uh, your identity travels with you. So you might have some sort of access point 
to the infrastructure, user identity to get there. Uh, you have some sort of workload that runs on a worker node. Your identity travels there to your worker node with you. And if that workload needs to access storage, that identity then travels to the storage service. Uh, to do, so that way the storage service can perform that identity mapping. So uh, to some extent, you know, I see this uh, previous picture is bad. You don't particularly have a good concept of least privilege, uh, that there's a lot of authorization that identity carries around with, with it. And we want the remote entity to only have the very minimal things it needs to operate as opposed to the remote entity having your entire identity. And in fact, the identity mapping itself is still uh, quite difficult to do. Uh, so a, a single user might manage one credential instead of 60 at six different sites. But each site still must manage 10,000 user accounts, for example, to support the LHC. So this is not exactly where we wanted to end up. And that gets us to a tip number two, uh, which is group mapping or, or, or group attributes. So a big conceptual leap occurred when really these sites realized that they don't care about the individual users. Uh, if, if CMS has 3,000 users or, or 5,000 users, uh, they don't care of the identity of Brian versus Diego versus Freya. What they want to know is that these are two distinct users and that they're members of CMS and therefore uh, uh, have the rights to what any CMS member can do. So for example, CMS might say, everybody can store a terabyte of data at a particular site. And they need to know the two distinct users. So the, the two users data maybe doesn't mix together, uh, but they don't care to establish an individual relationship with everybody uh, beyond knowing that they were within that the global or within that CMS experiment. And in fact, uh, to some extent, the, the usernames are, are somewhat irrelevant as well. So the, the fact that I prefer to be called Brian Bockelman uh, really doesn't matter at these remote sites that I have no relationship with. I might as well be CMS number 18. And though, you know, just as I said before, there's still a traceability requirement. Uh, we need to determine that all the actions of CMS 18, or that CMS 18 performed and be able to link it back to an individual. So the idea with group mapping is again, instead you take that global credential, you map it to a group and the authentication step. And then when you do the authorization, you just think about what that particular group is permitted to do in order to come up with a policy. So historically when the, the uh, distributed uh, grid community <coughs> has done this, uh, they've used a piece of software called the Virtual Organization Management Service, or, or VOMS. And we, it, it uses a uh, particular uh, extension uh, to X509 that, that is called an attribute certificate. So it takes that credential and appends some signed information from, in this case, CMS, telling you about the identity that uh, this is. So if I take my uh, CMS bombs certificate and print it out in human form, I see it has my identity, it's Brian Bockelman, uh, but it also shows that this Brian Bockelman has a extended signature from CMS and saying that he's a CMS member, he's part of the integration team, and he's part of the C US CMS group. And then a local map file at the site uh, is able to take the group information, map it to a local identity, and the rest proceeds as an identity mapping. So <clears throat> this uh, is what the kind of uh, sketch of the ecosystem looks like. I come in with my identity, my identity, uh, is complemented with a attribute from some sort of organizational issuer. And that, those two things is what, or, or what goes down to the worker node, then goes to the storage service. And the storage service can now think about 
just maybe this group information to decide the authorization policy. One thing that's an open question in the system is if CMS, you, you saw I had three different groups, if they want to communicate, only the integration group can access this particular directory, somehow this has to go out to the storage service. And uh, being a pragmatic physicists uh, that we work with, uh, this, for example, is often communicated through a wiki page or maybe an email from somebody to somebody else saying that, oh yeah, please make sure that you set up so integration can access this directory, uh, but not the USC folks. So this is one that was relatively underdefined in the, the group stage. <clears throat> but it's still a big step forward for the ecosystem. Uh, sites need to make a few dozen uh, authorization mapping decisions, not thousands of them. Uh, but there's still quite a few issues. Uh, there's not much fine grain authorization here. The decisions are simpler, uh, but it's no more fine grain than really the identity mapping. You still have a lot of power uh, that you hand out to that worker working on it. And I'd say uh, that there's still some layering uh, uh, violations that uh, sites really are handing some resources over to CMS and CMS is trying to decide what to do with them, but somehow CMS then has to go and tell the sites. Uh, again, this arrow right here, I see as a layering violation because the CMS issuer has to somehow communicate its own internal policies about its own resources to the storage service, as opposed to the storage service just saying, CMS, here's a couple petabytes, you go deal with it. So an important observation is that uh, if we're not using the individual's membership, or if we're doing all the authorization decisions based on an individual's membership in a group, uh, we are trusting the external organization to assert the membership. Why did we have that user's global uh, identity in the first place? Um, and and do, did we really need that global identity or can we just go based on what that organization was asserting about those. So about at, at 15, after about 15 years or so, we got to the point where uh, the organizational identity management practices were strong enough to really separate uh, that the separate identity, one from the CA and one to establish the organizational membership uh, were superfluous. Uh, the, the global identity, uh, was really just being used to distinguish two remote identity entities. So making sure that Brian and Diego didn't access the same data. So the question comes up, what would the system look like if we didn't even have X509 credentials? So this gets us to a tip number three, capabilities. <clears throat> and this gets back to that title of the talk, uh, capabilities uh, say what you can do not necessarily who you are. <clears throat> so we think of a, a capability as an unforgeable token that authorizes a given action on, on a particular object. Uh, so these uh, there's multiple ways to go about a capability-based system, but often that token or, or credential is really a bare token. So anybody who holds that and can show that they uh, give it is authorized to perform the particular action. And this is something, again, we use every day. Uh, your house key and your key ring is a capability. Uh, we assume that anybody with that key uh, is authorized to enter the door, even though we don't establish an identity. We don't know it's Dave Kelsey uh, when we are turning the house key. And, and often uh, when we enable URL sharing for Google Docs, anybody with the URL, regardless of who they might be, is a lot assumed to be authorized to edit the document. And capabilities are really attractive for us because uh, least privilege is very simple concept or a, a more straightforward concept to, to implement uh, because they say specifically within the token exactly what the bearer is allowed to do and nothing more. Uh, this is not a new concept, uh, it's, at least as far as I could find uh, the earliest reference to the idea of capabilities giving uh, 
specific authorizations, what you can do goes back to the 1966. So to say what is uh, old is new again. So uh, led by Jim Basney, uh, we put together the site tokens project that ran from uh, July 2017 to just recently. Uh, the aim of the project was to introduce a capabilities-based authorization infrastructure for distributed scientific computing. So that's the idea of using capabilities as our new authorization layer. Uh, provide a reference platform combining specific technologies. And then implement uh, very specific use cases to help our science stakeholders, uh, such as LIGO and LCST, better achieve their aims. And the idea here is you still have identity somewhere, uh, but that's maybe left at the door as you enter the, the distributed infrastructure. You have your access point where you start to get access to all the resources, and you might come with an identity. This might be a username password, it might be an SSH key, might be an X509 certificate. But once you're within the access point, uh, and especially before we get to the distributed resources, we switch to capabilities. So the idea is that there's still an issuer that issues a token that your identity has access to. And only that specific token, uh, it might say, I have read access to a particular directory. It might say, uh, I can check the status of particular jobs. It might be completely defined or uh, issuer defined uh, scope that you're allowed to do. But only that specific token uh, goes out onto the infrastructure and to the storage services. And you'll note here uh, with my token, if this is compromised, I might have a very narrow set of things that the token can be used to attack. Uh, as opposed to before, when I have a, a complete identity floating around. So in order to put this together, uh, we still use the CA ecosystem <clears throat> from before to associate a key pair with an organizational issuer. That issuer distributes bear tokens, uh, for example, asserting membership of the organization. And those contain specific authorizations about what the bear can do. And the tokens can contain other limits uh, on their validity, for example, expiration dates or audiences limiting what services that these are allowed to be used for. Uh, then on the service side, uh, the server can verify a token, ensure it's valid and signed by a particular issuer, and then permit the actions asserted by the issuer within the issuer's namespace. So the mapping looks a bit like this. So you go from a particular token. Uh, that gets verified, we go into an issuer and some token scopes within that issuer. And the authorization then maps what that issuer is allowed to do within our uh, local sites policy. The technology uh, behind this that we did with site tokens were JSON web tokens, which are uh, small, uh, relatively simple, uh, looking tokens describing key value pairs. Here's an example of one that's base64 encoded, and here's a, a decoded one. Uh, again, these are signed by a particular issuer. Here, this is our demo issuer, and contain key value pairs, uh, some standardized, uh, some not. So, uh, expiration time, issue that time, issuer, uh, demo, or uh, uh, audience. And um, <clears throat> here you can even see it has a subject. For, you know, again, for the idea of traceability. Uh, maybe we do all of the authorization decisions based on the scope, but the subject might still be needed to know what that particular user did that day. So you could implement all these ideas with X509, uh, but JWTs were uh, selected uh, mainly because they're a far simpler format. Uh, they're almost universally uh, supported across programming languages, uh, particularly in X509, we've seen many times complexity kills. Uh, there's a standard set of workflows on how to apply your tokens, and that's what you use every time for Google, Facebook, or GitHub logins. And they can be used very cleanly with HTTPS, where the prior system required on custom extensions to the, the transport layer. So JWTs ended up in this whole 
infrastructure ended up being actually far smaller, smaller and simpler than the old one, even though in terms of fine grade authorization, there's a far more expressive. Uh, so what tokens can authorize, they can authorize storage access. So they can say you can read and modify the storage within an issuer's namespace. Or maybe for Condor uh, services, you can say you can read and write uh, to a particular Condor access point. So looking at the example of issuers, uh, we might be able to say that within LIGO might issue a token that allows you access to frames. And maybe at Wisconsin allows LIGO to access uh, this mount LIGO directory. So if a user tries to access mount LIGO frames data.dat, uh, the server would verify the tokens supported, the issuer supported, the token signed correctly by the private key of the issuer, uh, apply limits such as expiration time, and then look at where the uh, tokens allowed to, uh, or look at the token scope, see if it's in frames, see that LIGO is mounted at mount LIGO, and then it says, okay, finally, yes, this client is authorized to read from Mount LIGO frames. So the sorts of properties uh, that from this ecosystem that uh, we particularly like uh, is we have <clears throat> distributed verification. As long as we can look up the issuer's private key, uh, we can determine the token's validity. Uh, it has some aspect of authentication and mapping. So the issuer, so that is the organization such as CMS or LIGO is mapped to some local access rights, uh, but we don't have that layering violation. We don't need to know about LIGO's internal policies since they express these specifically through the tokens. And then finally, uh, as you saw within that, that subject claim within the token, we do have the ability to provide some traceability attributes uh, as a, these are very important in some places. Now, uh, luckily, uh, we don't have to do all of, the, all of this uh, by ourselves. Uh, OSG uh, and site tokens and, and PATH all have some really important international or parts of important international collaborations. So we have to make sure that we remain uh, interoperable with uh, these these different entities. Uh, so sites, of course, have to be able to transfer with each other. So they have to have authorization schemes that are common. Uh, and that the, and then the tricky part, of course, is that there may not be any common management or funding agency. These really have to be done as collaborations, uh, which means uh, we need independent implementations. We must have some consensus, and we have to really show that we build and work together. So. One coordination body, the worldwide LHC computing grid has been uh, leading a lot of the standardization efforts and has taken some of the, for example, the early site tokens profiles of how to set up and use the JWT and produced a common WLCG common token profile that, that we're now using uh, uh, widely uh, across these ecosystems. So in the US, uh, OSG serves as a technology integrator. And I'd say that, uh, you know, it's moving big communities are a lot of effort, even though there were no development left to do today. Uh, helping all these different systems adapt uh, is still a multi-year effort. So accordingly, uh, we were lucky to have just been awarded uh, the SciAuth project. Uh, that start, uh, started here in July 2021. And this aims, I think, of, at some extent, as finishing the job of uh, these prototypes and uh, ideas that site tokens uh, started with. So SciAuth uh, allows us to provide effort to help the community transition to new authorization models. So it's no longer just prototypes or concepts. There is some technical effort to fill in gaps where it's necessary, but it's really no longer about developing a new ecosystem or new libraries. Uh, we think it's really important, and this project has in its goals to standardize and harmonize efforts uh, across the relevant bodies. And, and then finally, for me, uh, this continues advancing the idea of capability-based authorization and at least privilege inside the distributed system uh, and avoid the us 
re-implementing the GSI infrastructure with tokens instead of XYZMI. Uh, so to kind of wrap things up, uh, we got our whirlwind tour of how we approach authorization within this community. Uh, we got uh, started with identity mapping, uh, complemented with group mapping. And then finally, we're in this transition to capabilities and we're moving uh, further away from the idea of global identity and more and more from who are you to what you can do which I'd argue are really a natural fit to a distributed system like ours. Uh, and as it starts to provide a much better least privilege uh, and uh, separation of concerns. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the overview and we now have some time for questions. Yes, and um, while we're letting people type, I'm gonna grab the screen back. Sure. And just kind of go through some uh, simple community updates to just let people um, gather their thoughts. Um, so first, thanks everybody for joining our webinar. Um, the next webinar will be, um, <laughs> I apologize, I was one month off for both <laughs> announcing to this morning's webinar and, and next month's. Um, August 23rd is our next webinar, so there's a typo there. Um, but it is at 11 a.m. Eastern, and our topic is NCSA's SOC Type 2 certification. Our presenter is Alex Withers. Alex is um, the, um, the CIO or the CISO, I think, the CISO at NCSA. So um, he'll be presenting on that. And then another thing that I want to bring people's attention to is that we've already announced our call for presentations for the 2021 NSF Cybersecurity Summit. And that's going to be October 11th through 13th, um, but we haven't made any any additional announcements yet about you know firming up our uh, schedule and things like that. So please just uh, be aware that these announcements are coming, and you'll be getting um, notifications about when it's time to register and what the agenda will be, and things like that. And then, as always, to um, to contact us about our webinar series, you could you could go to trustedci.org slash webinars, or you could email me at webinars at trustedci.org. And with that, I'm going to hop over to the chat here. And so um, we did have a question come in earlier this morning, so I wanted to go through that. Um, as work submitted at one location runs at others, any security problems at one spot may propagate across the grid. What's the protocol for OSG sites handling compromised credentials, whether users or machines, so as to isolate the problem? Yeah, so I, I really like that question because it, 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 it um, touches into several of the things that, that uh, I, I cover in the, in the presentation. So, uh, I, I think of it as two ways. You know, one, one there is a incident response process, right? So, so we have a web page, and and there is a list of what to do. Uh, there's a security team who can work to uh, respond as as necessary. It's, of course, it's a bit of an abstract question, so different types of uh, incidents are going to be have different responses. Uh, but on my side, you know, when I'm thinking of the credentials, uh, my I don't necessarily uh, trust uh, uh, every single site to do a great job at uh, their incident response. Right? I, I, you know, we we have a wide variety of sites, and you know, at any time that you get that many people in a room, you have a, a, a Gaussian curve of how good that how adept they are at the following directions. So my mental question is, let's say the sites are, you have a compromised user credential and sites are relatively unresponsive or unhelpful or just very well-meaning, but very slow at responding. So when we have an identity-based system, uh, you have really powerful credentials that are going out over place. And the two things that we rely on on our revocation list and expiration. <clears throat> expiration usually works very well uh, because 
it, it's the software that manages that. Uh, I am very distrustful of revocation lists because it requires the sites to uh, be very proactive about uh, making sure that the revocation lists are up to date. And again, like I said, I don't trust sites. The new authorization or capability based scheme, uh, on the other hand, when you have a compromised credential, uh, the, the thing we have a number of additional limits that we put into the credentials these days in terms of what they're allowed to do. I don't get the power of Brian Bockelman. I get the power of writing into this specific directory at one particular site. Uh, so uh, we can isolate the power of, of problematic or compromised credentials. And the other thing, since, uh, and again, we could have done this maybe at X509, but uh, it's, uh, in this system, we've taken a far stronger emphasis on short-lived credentials. So uh, I really am pushing things to make sure that uh, things that go out to, say, the worker node or things from user jobs have credential lifetimes uh, well under an hour. So this way, we don't have to have rely quite as much on uh, things like revocation lists. Okay, so um, we'll see if they need to ask a follow-up, but we'll go to the next question here. Um, is there a standardized service catalog or something that the capabilities map into um, yeah. that the sites would publish out? Um, so since there are so many sites, uh, what, instead of having the, the sites publish out, here's all the definitions of our, uh, our, our local uh, capabilities. Uh, th this is the, the work that bodies like the, the WLCG has been doing and, and hopefully SIOF also in the future is to have some well-defined, uh, well-known scopes within the community. So uh, I, I showed a couple examples, I, I think of uh, one that said, you know, storage.read uh, or storage.write. And the idea is for a minimal set of, of capabilities, these are agreed to and interpreted in the same way uh, by all the different services and, and software providers. And that's, of course, you know, often what takes a long time to, to get agreement, uh, get consistent implementation, get interoperability tests to make sure that we all implement it in the way we thought we did, and uh, then finally out into the, the hands uh, of users. So, for, for me, I, I say it's really important that we have these uh, bodies where we can work together and make sure that we define that minimal uh, implementation or, or minimal set of things that we can agree upon. But what I also like about JWTs is the different sub-communities can add in their own uh, capabilities. So I, I don't think we really I don't think we'll be seeing site specific ones any day soon, uh, but maybe Fermilab for Dune has some very Dune specific ones, maybe to access their own internal web services. Um, we've got another question here. How might someone engage SIOS for implementation assistance? That, that's an easy question to answer because uh, the PI of, of SIOP here is uh, Jim Basman. Uh, so I would say definitely uh, go talk to Jim. Uh, the, 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 since we've been up and going for about a week or so, um, our uh, website might be a little bit on the light side right now, uh, but you know, there are nothing else are, I believe, contact points there. Uh, so I think there's, Definitely some opportunities to help uh, partner and work with the projects since uh, such early early days. We've got um, oh um, Jim typed in uh, please see sioth.org. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And then we've got another question here. What are some examples of a quote org issuer from slide twenty eight um, the software in production? Yeah, so the, the, the two big ones uh, that we've been working with uh, are uh, a, a issuer from the CI logon team uh, that's, uh, 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 Jim, do we, I'm not sure we have a, a fancier name for it than the site token issuer. 
but the, so so the CI logon runs a production instance, and uh, in fact is part of the uh, set of uh, subscription services you can get from CI logon. Uh, the other implementation out there is called uh, IAM, uh, Identity and Access Management. It's uh, produced out from the INFM, uh, which is a physics lab out in Italy. And uh, the, the INFM's IAM uh, software project is what a number of different European communities are, are using, uh, such as uh, CMS and, and, and Atlas. So, for this particular profile that we're using for, for the WLCG, those are the two kind of production grade software, uh, but there's also other, of course, token issuers. And one thing that we've tried to do within uh, the different pieces of software you see on slide 28 is to make sure that we are not using anything too specific to our infrastructure in terms of moving the tokens around. Uh, so my, my hope is that this can also back into other issues. Uh, we've done a demo for moving things from the access point to the worker node of using um, box. Uh, so, so people can actually ac access their, their box accounts from, uh, from a, a condo worker node. Okay, let's do one last quick call for questions. Um, but in the meantime, Brian, yeah, thank you very much for presenting. Um, do you have any other um, final thoughts or interesting things you want people to be looking out for? Um, where things are broken are always more interesting than all the places where we're doing well. So if you're seeing something here that looks interesting or you're seeing something that uh, you think could work better, feel free to follow up. I, I see. Uh, Jim dropped uh, the, the SciAuth website, and we're happy to have, engage in conversation. Great. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for attending this, this presentation. I will be um, cutting a, a, a video of this and posting it online, um, hopefully later today, and, and we'll be sending out the slides as well. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.